we go. I need you to go to Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. We're going to camp out here. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Panthers don't play today, do they? We got about a week. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yes, ma'am. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm coming from the New King James Version. Let's get into this thing. And the Bible says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as two sons. Notice right off the bat that God wants to exhort you. He's saying that the Hebrews forgot the exhortation and he's exhorting them as sons. Now, ladies, don't think that the Bible is chauvinistic because that word is plural. It's not in the singular, meaning that he's not just talking to men. He's talking to all children. Right. So and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as two sons. Watch this. My son and my daughters do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves. He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I'm going to give you a little secret. I didn't preach this this verse for a very long time because I couldn't reconcile it under the new covenant. Because that word scourge or that word scourge, that that's a very painful word. I didn't teach it for a long time, but then the Holy Spirit started giving me revelation on it, at least probably a couple of months to a year ago. Watch this. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Watch this. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chase him? I want to give this a very simple title. Whom he chastens whom he chastens It's very King James like but I was like Holy Spirit I ain't got no other title so this is the only one he gave me whom he chases look at your neighbor say whom he chases chases. whenever whenever I talk to the church planning team here at Ready Church I always try to encourage them I always try to make them laugh I always try to give them something in our group chat that, that that makes them think challenges their perspective And this past week, as I was prepping, as I was prepping, I I, I wanted to ask them a question because based on this sermon, I wanted to see if we were all thinking the same things. So so what I did was I asked them this question. I said, at any point in your life, did you ever believe that God was so hard on you that he was waiting on you to mess up to condemn you? Once again, I'm going to ask it again. I asked them at any point in your life, did you ever believe that God was so hard on you that he was waiting on you to mess up to condemn you? One person said, I never thought of it that way, but it makes sense because for a while I was walking on pins and needles scared to mess up. Somebody else said, yes, I used to believe that all the time to the point where I was like, oh, well, because I'm going to mess up anyway. Somebody else said, I never thought about it that way. And that's weird to me. I always condemned myself. I never thought about God. I never thought that God was waiting on me to mess up, but I will always feel like I couldn't approach God because I messed up. Somebody else said, yeah, I always felt like it was me beating myself up because God was disappointed in me because I sinned. This is the last one. This got me. Watch this. I felt like God was making me go through stuff because he was upset with me. And I thought that if I mess up, He would make it worse. I would always say, if there was a God, why would he make me go through this? And if he says he loves me, then this is not love. Is there anybody in the audience on today that you can relate to anybody in this thread? Is there anybody in this room who ever felt like when you messed up that God was waiting on you? He was ready to pounce on you. He was ready to punish you. That was me. For the first half of my life, waiting on God that whenever I sin, I knew that he was waiting on me to mess up. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not trying to be funny, but Lauren, this is real. I used to think that God was like Joe Jackson. Now, I'm not saying that God was literally Joe Jackson, but I'm just making an example. I used to really believe that God was like Joe Jackson, bro. Has anybody ever seen the the Jacksons in American Dream? You ever seen that biopic? It's super old. But, you know, I grew up with older people, so, you know, I watch everything that's, that's in the 90s. So that's one of my favorite movies. And in the movie, Joe Jackson, he was training the Jacksons on how to dance and how to, do the, how to do the dance moves. And, you know, they was in the living room and they was dancing and they was getting their groove on and they was doing what they were supposed to do. But then one of the boys, Marlon, he spinned and fell. 
And then Joe Jackson put his hand on his face and says, get back up, do it again. And then he goes back to dancing. He got this part, though. I mean, he working this part. But as soon as he spin, he fell down again. Joe Jackson got irritated and said, you don't concentrate. You don't listen. Marlon, get up, go outside, get a switch. And then Marlon, he says, no, I was really trying. I promise. He said, boy, be a man. Go outside, get a switch. He go, gets, he go and get the switch. He comes back in and Joe Jackson beats him. And listen, if you ever watch that biopic in their household, when one child get beat, everybody cry. Everybody cry. I mean, it's listen, it's an event when somebody get beat in their house. Everybody crying, the mama crying, all the brothers, and there's about 20 of them, all of, all, all of them sitting around crying. And then the next scene is this. Watch this. Marlon, he's outside, and he's dancing, he's dancing, and he's practicing the spin, and then he nails it. And then he, do, he, he does it again, and then he nails it. And then after a while, they do a talent show, and he nails a spin in the talent show. Joe Jackson is happy. And now he has that confidence. And now they're one of the greatest groups of all time, producing one of the greatest legends, Michael Jackson. But you know what? Maybe Marlon didn't become a good dancer because he wanted to be a good dancer alone. Maybe he became a good dancer because he was afraid of the punishment. Maybe he became a good dancer because he was afraid that if he didn't nail it, he was going to be punished again. How many believers are changing their behavior and trying to be good, not because they love God, not because they believe they are righteous, not because they believe they are holy, but because they are in fear of the perception of his punishment. There are some believers, I am one of them, that I was just like Marlon. I was, every day of my life, I was doing this. I was doing my best to move right. I was doing my best to dance right. And whenever I failed and whenever I made a mistake, I knew that God was condemning me. The problem was it wasn't God condemning me, it was me. The Bible says in Romans 8.1 that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How can God operate in condemnation when it's not in his son? And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. If Jesus is not condemning you, then God is not condemning you. The problem is whenever we mess up, we condemn ourselves. And the real issue is we live life avoiding sin. You live every day in your life trying not to make a mistake. And the problem is whenever you live life trying to avoid sin, you end up falling in sin anyway because your mind is still set on the sin. The only way you can stop sin is by the grace of God because grace will confront sin. The Bible says in Titus that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. If you are under the law, if you're still under a legalistic mentality, you will still have sin uh, reigning over you. How do I know that the Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law. You are under grace. Now, even though the Jacksons became superstars at the hand of a somewhat abusive father, they became superstars. Michael Jackson is one of the most celebrated artists of all time. But look at the trauma that came from their household. We all know that Michael Jackson changed his face, not because he wanted to, but because of the abuse of his father. His father picked on his nose. His father picked on his skin color. His father picked on his skin condition. Think about how much trauma he went through. You got all the money. You got all possibly got everything you want. But watch this. When you don't have the approval of your father, you're still broken. How many believers are walking around in churches today? Or how many people have left the faith because they didn't know that God already approved them? And they were working for his approval. And because you're working for his approval, you believe that whenever you mess up, God is beating you up. God is condemning you. God is punishing you. But I came to tell you today that God does not beat you into submission. He loves you into it. God does not punish you with pain, but he corrects you in kindness. Listen, y'all, he's a really good father. It's not just a song. We love to sing he's a good, good father. But do you really know it? We love to sing these songs out of cliche, but do you know that your daddy really is good? Watch this. The Bible says in Matthew 7, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Listen, today is my son's third birthday, right? He's three years old today. And I got my son those brand new 
Red nines, those Jordans, those branded, them, them joints is fresh. I was going to get them for me, but I was like, I'm going to make sure my little man's straight. I got enough. I'll get them later. But listen, that's a really good gift. Like, it's, 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 it's pretty dope. Has anybody ever gotten a good gift from their father? Anybody? You have? Okay, you got a great gift from your father? Listen, I ain't got no gift from my daddy, so don't, 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 don't feel bad. It's okay. But listen, if you've ever gotten a great gift from your father, how did that make you feel? It made you feel special. It made you feel empowered. Watch this. If your earthly daddy know how to give you a good gift that can empower you, what you think your father in heaven could give you? Watch this. He already gave you his best gift and his name is Jesus. You might got a computer, but he gave you Jesus. You might got some ear pods. You might got some sneakers. You might got a brand new car. You might got a house. But like the older generation used to say, can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. He's a good father. That's the whole point of this message compilation. I'm trying to show you that your father is good. There's nothing but good in him. That's all he knows. But he gets blamed for a lot of bad stuff. And one of, and one of, and one of the things that they use is a scripture that's out of context. Let me tell you this. Whenever you read the Bible, you always want to read scripture in context. If you take the text out of context, what are you left with? A con. So if you're left with a con, I can tell you whatever I want to tell you. If you're left with a con, I can make God look any way I want to. If you're left with a con, I can make you do things and watch this and use the Bible. Look at the look at the African slave trade. They took the Bible out of context. They didn't preach Jesus. They didn't preach Paul in context. They preached the law. And they preach certain aspects of the law of, of, of Paul without teaching the freedom of Jesus. Listen, you can't enslave a people and use scriptures when Jesus said who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. They didn't teach that. There's an actual slave Bible in D.C. where it's actual passages missing out of the Bible. Because if I want to enslave you, I'm going to teach you what I want. Watch this expecting you not to read. Amen. This is a church where you're going to have to read. I've told you this before. If you don't understand what I'm saying and you don't like it, go to the Bible. Let's talk about it. Me and Gary, didn't we talk like two or three times this week about stuff? Me and Gary go back and forth all the time. He enlightens me. We go back and forth. I need people like him. He got to keep me on my square. You need people in your life that's going to challenge you. And the problem is the reason why a lot of people in the pulpit say what they want to say because the people don't challenge them. I'm going to get off that soapbox. I'm going to keep moving. Listen, watch this. The Bible says, watch this. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. Let's go back to it. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Now, when you see that word chasten, you can think of the English word chastisement, right? Now, when we think of chastisement in the earth, we think of a stern conversation. You think of a very abrasive conversation. You think of somebody talking to you in a very firm way. Anybody ever had a, a fussing moment with their mama? Right. And you right. And you when you hear that fussing moment, you just you just you just want to I'm melting. You just want to just go down. Right. That's what we think about chastisement. And listen, don't get yelled at before you go to school. And you get on that bus and everybody like, man, what's wrong with you? I'm straight, bro. <laughs> and you just feel bad because that's what that's what we think about. Or that's what I think about when I think of chastisement. But watch this. In this scripture, that's not what the word chastising means. That's not what the word chastening means. In the original Greek, that word chasten or chastening is patio. Look at your neighbor and say patio. Say it louder. Say patio. P-A-I-D-E-O-U. P-A-I, that word is where we get our English word pediatrician, right? That D-O means to train like a child. You put both words together, you get childlike training, which means that God is training you like a child. So when it says, watch this, it says, do not despise, watch this. It says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the child training of the Lord. Can I tell you something? God always looks at you like children. God always looks at you as his baby. Yes, you are an adult. Yes, you can be mature. But in the eyes of God, you will always look like your baby. And the number one thing you need with children is patience. Yes, sir. That's a message in itself. Because these last three years, my God, Ebo, Shoko, Toyada, Shoko. 
patience. You need patience with children. I love my mother more than ever now because if I was like that, my Jesus, I know God was like, ha, your turn. You need patience when it comes to children. You see, the great thing about God is God is patient, but I'm learning patience. God is patience. That's who he is. I'm developing in patience. Watch this. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says the Lord does not delay his promise. Talking about Jesus returning as some understand delay. Watch this. But he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It is the will of God that all come to repentance. But watch this. But everybody hasn't come to it yet. So this is talking about his patience with us. God is long suffering. We serve a God who is willing to walk with you. We serve a God who is willing to explain it over and over and over and over and over and over again. How many people believe that God loves them? Now, watch this. How many people just started getting a revelation of that? Boom. Now, so let's take me. I really didn't understand that God loved me till I turned about 25. Like I knew it. I understood it. I got it. But for the first half, you would say it, but you don't understand it. You see, God is so good that he has patience until you get revelation. And he will work with you in that space to where you don't have it. He's long suffering. Maybe if we have more long suffering, more churches will be full. Because we like to put people on deadlines. We like to say, aren't shouldn't you be delivered by now? Shouldn't you be set free right now? Shouldn't you have stopped doing that? But then the problem is we got Christians who've been saved for 20 years, but you still mean. We got Christians who've been saved for 35 years, but you still judgmental. It's not about a deadline. It's the one who was sent here to die. And when Jesus got up out the grave, there is no time clock because I'm already like him. And every single day of my life, my mind is being transformed into him. And even when I mess up and even when I fall, we serve a God who will repeat himself over and over and over and over again. If you got children, you know good and well, you get tired of that. And what's that black mama favorite phrase? I bet not tell you again. I bet not to, I, I B-E-T, not tell you again. I bet not. Everybody know that. But watch this. What's happened? We're still learning patience. But God, he loves you so much that he's willing to repeat it over and over. Hey, I love you. Hey, you're righteous. What if I do something unrighteous? Hey, I'm still repeating it because I believe that the more you tune into my voice and the more you give your heart to me and the more you renew your mind, sooner or later, you're going to get that revelation. And until you get it, I'm just going to keep reminding you. He treats you like children. He's patient with you. I'm so glad that I serve a God who is patient with me. I don't know about you, but there's some things in my life that I still need to hear every single day that you love me, that you care for me, that I'm still working with you. Watch this, that I'm still going to use you. I love this, y'all. Watch this. My, my cousin went to dinner with him the other night. He reminded me of this revelation. God has the ability to use you while he's changing you. Some of us think that Christianity is a destination. No, baby, it's a journey. So even when I fall on my journey, he'll pick me back up and remind me over and over. Don't you remember, for those of you who have children, when, when you knew your child couldn't walk, but you put him on the ground anyway? I do that with my son now. My son, Jayden, he be he's like James Brown. He be kicking them suckers. He can't walk. He can't walk. But he wants to walk so bad. But I hold him up because I know that eventually, if I keep putting his feet on the ground, sooner or later, they're going to stick and he's going to walk. I came to tell you that your father is holding on to you, that you might be walking fast and you might not put your feet on the ground. But he knows sooner or later, keep kicking your feet, keep walking in my will, keep walking in my plan and your feet going to hit the ground and you're going to walk in your purpose. We serve a God who's patient. We serve a God who's willing to walk with us. Now, this is the next part I need you to rock with me. Can we go to Ready University real quick? Can we teach, Garrett, can we go here for a minute? Ready University? Now I have to become a professor because I have to teach you something, okay? Watch this. The Bible says, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, meaning corrected. Now, this is the part that I didn't like to preach, Garrett. Watch this. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, that word scourge 
is not a beautiful, beautiful word. That word scorch in the original Greek is mustigo. Everybody say mustigo. mustigo. Say it louder. Say mustigo. mustigo. That word in the Greek means to take a whip, a cat of nine tail, and at the end of that whip, it's got metal, it's got nails, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. And you literally take that whip and you put it on somebody's back to literally break their skin into pieces. Has anybody ever seen The Passion of Christ? Y'all remember that scene? I'm trying to be graphic. You remember that scene where they was whipping Jesus and he put that whip on his back and they got caught and you ripped it out? That's what Mastigo is. That's what Mastigo is. That's what that is in the Greek. And watch this. It's a criminal type of punishment. Only criminals got it. Now, there are people who preach this and say that's what God's conviction is like. But the problem is you can't use that word for conviction to your soul because that word literally means mustigo. It means that God will whip you on your back and, rip and, and rip your back into pieces. That don't sound like a good God. Don't sound like it. So this is what I'm going to take issue with. And you, we can talk about it. We can go back and forth on it. Maybe after the service, that's fine. But I'm going to challenge this and say that this word was just poorly translated. I'm going to say that this word was poorly translated when it was translated from the Hebrew to Greek. Watch this. Now, the Hebrew, the, the book of Hebrews was written to who? Hebrews, which is another name for Jews. So the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews in Hebrew. I'm going to say that one more time. It was written to Hebrews in Hebrew. And the reason why it's under the new covenant is because the writer and people don't know whether it's Paul. People don't know whether it's James. I'm not here to debate that. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, when they translated it to Greek, they used the word mastigo instead of using the original Hebrew word, which is bicarette. Everybody say bicarette. Not cigarette. Say bicarette. Bicarette. Now, I know I'm just joking. Listen, in the in the Hebrew, that word bicarette means to deeply inquire. To deeply inquire. So when the when the book was translated from Hebrew into Greek, the translator, they had a choice. Either I'm going to use mastigo or I'm going to use bicarette. Now, why they didn't cho choose to use chose to use bicarette, I don't know. But if you look at the context of the scripture, like what we talked about earlier, the word still means the same because you can either deeply inquire in someone's skin or you can deeply inquire in someone's life. So I'm going to say that that word right there is meant to say bicarette because watch this. The word scourge was invented before the weapon. So that word scourge in the Hebrew means bicarette, which means to deeply inquire. So you can actually read the scripture like this. Watch this. Stay with me. For whom the Lord loves, watch, he trains like a child and he deeply inquires in the sons whom he receives. Is that not beautiful? We serve a God who treats you like a child, who has patience with you like children, and he deeply inquires in your life. So when you see that word scourge, it's a scary word to read it. But when you do your due diligence behind it, all it means is, is that God wants to be involved in your life. When you got a good father, ain't your father all in your business? Not so that he can know your business, but so that he can become your business because he is the solution. God's not trying to get all up in your life so he can know. He already know everything. He wants to be a help to you. Well, Canaan, how does God correct us? How does God rebuke us? Watch this. The Bible says that whom he loves, he chastens. God trains out of love. God trains you out of love. If there's anything else you need to hear or anything else you don't get, that's what you need to get today. God trains you out of love. How do I know that? The Bible says that God is love. That's all he knows. It's in his nature. God loves you. God is not training you to hurt you. God is not punishing you. And let me tell you this. God has never and will never use sickness, disease or lack to teach you a lesson. That's not the God that we serve. There are people in the earth today who believe God gave me cancer so that he could teach me something. Or God took away my child so he could teach me something. If God wanted to teach you something, he teach you through his word. 
The Bible says this in Isaiah. The Bible says, watch this. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. This is Jesus. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. Jesus was pierced because of me, because of my rebellion. Watch this. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And by his wounds, I am healed. The sickness that I was supposed to get was put on Jesus. God's not going to put sickness on me. Why? Because he already put it on his son. People have this idea. They say we don't preach God's judgment enough in church. We don't preach God's punishment enough. We don't preach God's wrath. And you know what I say? The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, that because of Jesus, I now have peace with God. Amen. Because all the wrath I was supposed to get, he put it on Jesus. He took all of the wrath, all of the anger, all of the judgment, and he judged his son so that I could be free. God is not trying to shake you with sickness. He's not trying to teach you something. I've heard people say, yeah, man, I'm going through this. And this is a believer now. I'm going through this because God is trying to teach me patience. Can I tell you something? The Bible says that patience is a fruit of the spirit. You already got peace, uh, patience on the inside of you. All you got to do is tap into it by faith. God don't have to put you through something in order for you to use it. Now watch this. You may go through trials and tribulations and patience will be developed, but God is not going to put you through an accident. Let me ask you a question for those of you who got children. If you got children, watch this. Imagine your child disobeyed you and you took that child and broke their arm. Think about it. Imagine... Imagine you told your child to do something over and over and over and over and over again, Isaiah, and they didn't listen, and you took a needle with cancer in it and you injected it in them. Injected it in them. Foul, right? What well, they say that about God? They say that God do stuff like that. They say that God does things like that. They says God, put, God puts people through pain. God, God puts people through trouble. Listen, the Bible does say that you shall have trials and tribulations, but watch this. Be ye of good cheer because you've already overcome them. I'm not saying that you won't ever go through things, but I'm telling you, you serve a God who will walk you through it. Because when you come out on the other side, you will be better. But one thing he's not going to do is put sickness on you. He's not going to put disease on you. He's not going to put hurt on you. It was not God's fault that your boyfriend broke up with you. Maybe it just wasn't the one. It wasn't God. It wasn't God's fault that you lost that job. Maybe, 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 maybe it was just time for a layoff. But can I tell you something? Anytime a layoff happens in the earth, get ready for promotion. That's it. That's right. And the same God who took care of you and provided, jo provided that job can get you another one. So many times when something happens, you know what we say? What did I do? You know what we do whenever pain hits our body? What did I do? And you know what you're doing? You're going back under the law. Because listen to what you said. What did I do for God to do this? No, 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 no. Just because you're in the earth and you're under the new covenant don't mean that Satan ain't going to try to try you. There's still an enemy out here. He's still going to test you. But the Bible says that you've already overcome the world. The Bible says submit you to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's Bible. That's James. Listen, whenever you have a trial coming to your life, submit to the father. And I mean, submit talking about not just salvation, submit your soul, submit your weapons, submit your ideals and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I don't know what's going on, but I command that every angel in heaven go to work for me. You have that authority. You have the, you have the ability to command things to happen in your life. Now, listen, I'm not talking about just speaking things magically into existence. I'm talking about resting in your identity and allowing that to come out of your mouth, not because you got power, but because your father in heaven has power. If my son ever needs something, he says, Daddy! Don't he, Jair? There you go. Listen. <laughs> Daddy, my son, he just did it at the right time. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's just in tune with the sermon. That's what's up. That's cool. But listen, whenever your child needs something, daddy, one thing about my nephew, Cameron, I love my nephew. That's my dog. One thing that he's been doing since he was a child, mama, 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 mom. Why well, I'm talking. I'm talking to Jamaica. Mama, ma, ma. And I'm like, Jamaica, I know you hear this boy. I know you hear him. And then she say, what, Cameron? And in the softest voice, I'm hungry. But watch this, watch this. You serve a God 
You serve a God that whenever you call, he answers right then. And watch this. You might not see it immediately. But listen, you got to trust that he heard you when Jesus was on the way to heal Lazarus. I love when Jesus says this, Gary. He says, Father, I know that you hear me. Ah, I know that you hear me. Listen, you might be going through something now, but you got to have faith that your father hears you. Have faith that he hears you because he's your daddy. Well, 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 Ken, if he corrects us out of love and he's training us out of love, one thing we got to understand is that God is not punishing you for the past, but he's correcting you for the future. And a lot of times where we mess up is this is my second point. We have to learn as believers. We have to learn how to receive the rebuke. Watch this. We have we have to learn how to receive the rebuke. If you study the word rebuke. In the original Greek, it's the same word as convict. So when you go read John 16 and you and you read what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and the believer of righteousness. You could basically say because it's the same word, the Holy Spirit rebukes the world of sin and rebukes the believer of righteousness because you are redeemed. The rebuke is redemptive. You come under what I call redemptive rebuke. Meaning that God is not condemning who you are. He's correcting who you are while rebuking and exposing the righteousness that's on the inside of you. The part where we mess up is sometimes when somebody rebukes you or when somebody corrects you, you want to always take it as if they're offending you. We want to always take it as, oh, you hurt my feelings and your feelings ain't hurt. It's your pride. That's all it is. Can I tell you something? It's, it's amazing to me that in this new pastoral role that everybody Billy wants to correct me, but I can't correct them. Everybody wants to correct me. Everybody wants to tell me what to do. They want to tell me how we should do things. They want to tell me we should implement this. We should implement that. But as soon as I try to help them based on the spirit of God, because listen, I'm not going to get involved in your life. I'm not going to press myself on you. I'm only going to tell you by the spirit of God what you need to do. That's not my job. I ain't going to lord over you. But whenever I try to tell them something, oh, who who you? Who, who, who you think you are? Can I tell you something? If you don't have anybody in your life to rebuke you, you get comfortable because you're not going anywhere. If you don't have anybody in your life to correct you, get comfortable because you won't be promoted anywhere. And it's not God. It's just that you won't be able to handle the promotion because you don't know how to take constructive criticism. I didn't tell you to receive condemnation. Condemnation, it talks about who you are. But redemptive rebuke corrects what you did while reminding you of who you are in Christ. A lot of times we don't like being corrected. A lot of times we don't like being told because, oh, you trying to control me. You know what's amazing, I carry, is that people want a preacher, but they don't want a pastor. People want a preacher. They, they, they want to come to church and they want to hear a good sermon. They want to go home. They want to shout a little bit. They want to book a little bit. They want to run around the church. They want a preacher. but They don't want a pastor. They don't want somebody to help them and, and be with them and say, listen, in this area, you was wrong because we love being right. We love it. It makes us feel good. We love being right. I'm always right. I can't be told anything. And listen, I am preaching to you from the standpoint because, listen, there are moments where I'm like, no, I'm right. I'm, I'm being for ask my wife. I'm being for real. Sometimes it's like, bro, no, I know. I don't want to hear. I'm right. But watch this. You have to be humble enough to walk away from the conversation and let the Holy Spirit deal with you. Because the problem is the reason why we get in arguments is because we're talking too much and you're not letting the Holy Ghost talk enough. If you got a spouse in the room, let me tell you something. Sometimes you need to walk away and let the Holy Ghost deal with them because your mouth is just getting in the way. I failed it this many times, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, I promise you, when you're in a debate, when you're in a disagreement, you have to be so in tune with the Holy Ghost. Be so sensitive to him to say, you know what? Get out the way. I got you. But you know what we like to do? We like to argue. We like because I got this point and ain't nothing like walking away from a debate and getting a fire point and coming back. And then you going back at it again. And then they say something to you and then you walk away and then you come back and you got more fire. And it's, listen, it's, it's, it's nothing like it. But you know what that is? It's pride. It's pride. 
One thing that the Holy Spirit was dealing with me last night, Billy, it was so good. I was prepping. I woke Jair up, Jair up to tell her this. The Holy Spirit ministered to me as I was prepping. He said, listen, what you have to understand is you have to be able to receive rebuke from anybody, but you don't receive it from everybody. You have to be able to receive it from anybody, but you don't receive it from everybody. So then I so 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 when I got that, I was like, why? I literally said, why? The Holy Spirit said rebuke has to match revelation. Rebuke has to match revelation. I've been going through something these last like probably like two months where somebody ain't, ain't, ain't nobody business. So I'm just telling you somebody has been trying to rebuke me on some things. They've been trying to tell me. What I should be doing, what I shouldn't do. They trying to discuss certain things with me. And the Holy Spirit said, when somebody rebukes you, they have to have the same level of revelation of the word as you. Because if they don't have the same revelation of the word as you, they will try to rebuke you in anger out of misunderstanding. It's not that what I'm teaching is wrong. You just don't understand it. So because you don't understand it, because watch this, some people, they just don't understand what God is speaking to you and speaking through you. As long as you can back it up with the word, that's all you need. Amen. There are some arguments you don't need to consider. That's it. You see, me and Gary can go back and forth because we on the same page as far as revelation. We can go back and forth. We can go back and forth and say, well, what about this and what about that? And I can receive from him. He can receive from me because we both understand something that we're both the righteousness of God in Christ. And I know that even at this debate, after this debate, if I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me. We both still righteous. Amen. Some people I, you can't argue with somebody who still believes that you got to work for righteousness. You're going to lose that argument all day. You're going to be arguing to a brick wall. If they believe you got to work to be righteous, it's over. Just let it go. And watch this. When you walk away. You do two things. You can walk away in love and you let the Holy Spirit deal with them. Even if they never receive, it ain't your job to help them receive. Because everybody ain't going to receive from you. Listen, you ain't meant to pour into everybody's life. That's not what you call to do for everybody. You're not meant to pour into everybody. There are some people where you can plant and God will water and he gets to increase. Or we plant Garrett water and God gets to increase. That's what Paul talks about, right? He talks about that in Corinthians. There are some times where you got to plant the seed and walk away. Billy come by and water it. Boom. Because watch this. Sometimes, sometimes people can only receive, and it's sometimes immature, but sometimes people have to have the right personality in order for you to pour into them. Now, I mean, listen, we should be able to receive from anybody, but everybody's still growing. Everybody can't receive from me. I might be too abrasive. But you see, Garrick might be able to come past and say and say it in the right way and they receive it. But I can't get mad. She by Kosoto. I can't get mad because they received it from you. I need to be glad that God got the increase. That's why we got so much competition in churches, because they mad that people not receiving from me. And you mad because they're getting, re they're getting it from somebody else. I'm not mad at nobody else in the city. You know what I'm glad about? As long as Jesus is glorified. Amen. That's the only thing I need to be concerned about. That's it. So we have to know that God is chastening us in love. Watch this. And we have to understand that we have to know how to receive the rebuke. Why? Third point, we're going home. We have to know that God wants to deeply inquire in us. I'm going to go back to Bicarette. Does anybody, did anybody growing up, did you have that mama that didn't allow you to keep a door shut in the house? Right? You ain't, I know that was in my own house. I, I need to know what you're doing. I'm using the bathroom, so keep the, I pay for the doors. I pay the rent. Keep the doors open. I need, know, I need to know what you're doing at all times. Because when, when you shut the door, you could be praying. You keep the door shut while you keep the door open while you're praying. I don't care if heaven comes down, keep the door open. I need to know what you're doing at all times. Everybody had that type of mama, that type of daddy. And if you did shut that door, and they told you not to do it, or that door coming off the hinges. You ain't going to have a door. You're just going to have a blank space. The Spirit of God wanted me to tell you this on today. He says that he wants to deeply inquire in every area of your life, but there are some doors shut in some places that he wants to heal. 
Some of us have places, some of us have secrets, some of us have things that we don't want to deal with, and we keep shutting him out in certain areas. Listen, the Bible says that God will never leave you nor forsake you, but there are some secret doors in your life that he wants to open. He already knows it's there, but you have to let him in to heal it because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Listen, God is your Lord, but I came to ask you, is he Lord over your sex life? God is your Lord. Jesus is Lord. But is he Lord over your finances? Jesus is Lord. But is he Lord over your thought life? Is he Lord over your stewardship? Is he Lord over your commitment? Is he Lord over the job you don't like? Because you might not like it, but he can still be Lord over it because he's using you and using you in it to train to train you to take you to another level. He can be Lord of your salvation. But is he Lord when it comes to the things that you don't want to give up? There are certain things that he wants to deal with. There are certain things that he wants to get into your room. I'm ready, Chris. There are certain things that he wants to get into your life. He wants to go into your soul because there are certain doors that are shut and you're keeping them closed. It ain't him. The Bible says, behold, I send it the door and knock. He just wants to get in certain areas, get in certain places so that he can heal every part of your life. That's all he wants to do. Because I believe it's the will of God that he wants everybody healed in every area of their life. But the Holy Spirit is saying he wants to deeply inquire in you.